for inviting Wendy and I to speak about our Pro Home project. It's a community run project um, based around the parish of Port Moak, and we are located to the, uh, the east of Kinrosher, to the north, east, and south of Loch Leven. And here's the team you might recognise one of those faces at the end there. Um, he's here again. Uh, the project is funded primarily by a modest Heritage Lottery Fund grant under the Story Stones and Bones programme. Um, the HLF grant is partially mar matched by a Historic Environment Scotland Property and Care grant as well. And the project is run under the auspices of Kinross Museum. Uh, Wendy and I have no archaeological background whatsoever. We're completely people. We have our own trowels. And that's about as far as it goes as, as, as expertise is concerned. But we do have a, a very keen interest in our local history. Um, we've both volunteered with the Living Lomans programme in the past, and I have also volunteered with the Tea Landscape Partnership over the last few years. However, fortunately on the team, we have the vast knowledge and expertise of Professor David Monroe and also Ollie O'Grady of ODT Heritage, who is our consultant archaeologist. Uh, so our programme this year, um, we have run um, over well, nearly 30 different events and activities. We set out with two main objectives. Firstly, to share what's already known about the area's history and heritage, and to share that with the community in Port Moak and beyond. And then secondly, to involve the community in uncovering new knowledge about the area's past. So throughout the year, we've created a very broad programme of events and activities Quite often we've um, had the involvement of partners such as Scottish Natural Heritage, uh, we've worked with a local primary school and other groups in the community. The programme has included archaeological digs, walks and talks, music and prose evenings in our local pubs. We've produced a book of local stories and legends which was written by David Monroe and we have recorded many oral histories uh, told in their own words by the residents of the area. Uh, we've also, with the help of one of our volunteers, who uh, luckily is uh, involved in mapping systems as his day job, we have created an interactive web-based map that includes key sites of historical interest across the parish, along with details of finds and artefacts uh, from across the area. Uh, that's online at the moment, and that's the, the web page you can find it at if you're interested in having a look. You can click on any of the dots or icons on there to, to get more information about them. Um, so there's a whole lot that we can share today about all the varied elements of our project, but today we're going to concentrate on the archaeological work and its findings. <coughs> Here is the, the Port Moak area. The black outline shows the boundary of Port Moak Parish, hugging the shores of Loch Leven and stretching up into the Lomond Hills. The symbols on this map represent the locations that we included in our programme of archaeology. The sites we chose to investigate cover the six millennia of known human activity in Port Moak. Okay, hopefully this will work, but if not, is it is it working? Can you hear me? I can project as well. It'll take about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about one of our activities. It was um, located in an area of uh, Port Moak called Kilmagad Wood, and which sits in between the villages of Kineswood and Scotland Well. Um, you may have heard, hopefully several times, of the Kilmagad Wood urns, um, which was 23 Bronze Age burial urns um, uncovered by Derek Hall in 2012. So we as a group thought, well, if he found that many, potentially there could be more. It's a large field and stretches out across the base of the hill. So the red area is the area that we investigated. You can see it sits at the base of the Bishop Hill and just where the land comes down towards what used to be the shoreline quite a long time ago. Well, when the, during the Bronze Age, the shoreline was much closer. So we used a uh, kind of a high tech surveying equipment, geophysical equipment that, uh, from Germany that has 16 sensor points which puts GPS markings on whatever features it finds. So if you go back and you want to dig it, you have the exact location of whatever feature you found. Wonderful stuff called magneto. 
and Carly can tell you more about it, he found it for us. Um, and so we did this large field in an afternoon, and it was done very quickly, and you can see that um, there's a big pipeline going through and some other um, field drainage type work. But there's not a lot of information there, and particularly in this side of the field, where these straw bales are is where the 23 urns were found by Derek. And you can see all these round little symbols here on the right side. We didn't know what they were. Thank you. You can see, if you, if you zoom in, you can see a lot closer. And we don't know yet, but what we think in the initial reading, this is the interpretation by Ollie, actually. I'll put his, his map up. Um, you can see that there are groupings of these dots. And that would be very consistent with, Derek, I'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, um, very consistent with the way the urns were found in the um, house sites on the right. Um, so, and if we're right, and if those little blobs are urns, look at how many there are. That's very exciting. Um, and the rest of the field, as you go to the west, is a little less, there's a little less activity. But on the far, far west, um, we think there might be pits on potentially the remains of other long or round houses. So more the settlement um, for this area. Um, in addition to that, while doing some uh, walkover in, the, in that field, we found some uh, pieces of flint as well, which was indicate that there was activity going on there before the Bronze Age. But, um, that wasn't our focus here, so what, the point we're at now is that we have this field full of incredible magnetic spikes and we'd love to get more money and do more investigation of it. Moving on to the, the Iron Age, uh, Dunmore is, as its name suggests, is a big hill to the south side of Loch Leven. Uh, it's a rocky outcrop just beyond the end of Bernarty Hill and obviously quite typical of those chosen in the Iron Age as a location for a hill fort. The site is unscheduled and it was hitherto uninvestigated. We wanted to find out more about the settlement that was here, what size it could have been and when it was built. Uh, from the road, Dunmore looks very steep and narrow, but when you look at it from above, uh, there's some clear stone features and the outlines of enclosures can be seen. Um, the entrance to the fort is also visible, and our dig took place across the boundary of one of the enclosures, quite close to the main entrance. There it is there. So we dug a small trench, two metres by three metres, uh, and posi positioned it right across the edge of the very steep side of the hill. It was very steep. It doesn't quite show you here how steep it was, but only those with a great head for heights could actually work at the base of the trench. No danger money was paid. Um, after two days of work, we had exposed uh, what we would describe as a huge wall, uh, which was at least 1.5 metres thick and 3 to 4 metres high. Uh, the foundation deposit can clearly be seen here, along with the location of several post pads indicating a possible timber lattice structure. The wall has been well made and its origi origins are estimated to be in the early Iron Age. Hopefully, the dating of charcoal we found at the site will help us to be more definitive. The interior of the wall yielded evidence of occupation of the site in the form of burnt clay. Um, we also found 7 kilograms of slag, evidence that metal working took place in the fort's lower enclosure. So from our two days' work, uh, we can conclude that Dunmore was clearly an important seat of local power, a great location within the site of East Lomond, which you can see just behind John's head. Who's the chap? Right. Um, and within sight of other nearby hill forts as well. So it would have been the most visible monument in the local area in its day, um, and the hill does remain so uh, just now, nowadays from the road. OK. Um, the parish of Port Moat takes its name from an area on the mainland, um, which was 
was settled during the time of the Colby monks on St. Sir. Some of you will know about the Colby monks on St. Sir, and after them, the Augustinians who came in. Um, on the mainland, right opposite that island, is this area, Port Moke. Port meaning a port, and Moke meaning servant of God. So we know through history and, and several references in history that um, there was a connection between these two sites and that um, but we don't know what was happening on the mainland. So at the moment, the area on the mainland is um, a glider site, it's a grinding field. Um, before that was the parish church, and before that was the various monasteries and chapels of the Colonies and the Augustinians. But we don't know a lot more about that. We don't have a lot of definite data. So we thought we would explore more of what was going on on the mainland. Um, the only thing we had to go by, other than some historical references, was this beautiful cross slab found by David Monroe in 1976. Um, and, and I haven't seen Jane's presentation today, and I'm very eager to get her down there and have her look at this thing for us so we can um, better understand it and date it. But um, we chose an area in the middle of gliding uh, runway, north runway. Uh, we were very careful not to get hit by gliders. Um, it was an accident. Um, so what we started with was the geophysical survey that we, same equipment we had used up in the urn field. And it's excellent because it's towed behind a vehicle and you can do an extraordinary amount of work in a short period of time. And probably most of you in this room have had experiences with the um, old um, geophysical survey equipment you had to yank up and kick, and yank up and kick. Anyway, this was fabulous. It gets pulled behind a truck and you get a lot of work done quickly and you get GPS coordinates for everything you find. It's great stuff. Anyway, to just explain this a little bit, um, the area on the left is a lower elevation. Everything on the right is, is higher. And when the lock level was higher than it is now, it was very boggy and marshy. And in fact, you can see the shoreline on the left side. Um, where the buildings are and the caravans is the high ground and the remains of a, a chapel and what had ultimately been the parish church for a while. Um, so everything in the middle of the trees is high ground, everything on the left was underwater. And on the very top is where we were looking, to the right, and we found, can we put the interpretation on? Thanks. Um, we can see the shorelines and field drainage and everything on the top looks a lot more interesting. Um, we could, we, there were some cotter houses up there, cotter cottages, and we saw evidence of rig and furrow plowing and corn drying kilns and that sort of thing. But what was really interesting was that curved line. You can see where it says enclosure with a question mark and the internal division as well. Um, we thought, wow, if this was a monastery, and if the monastery was bigger than we thought, never mind just being a way to get over to the island, what if? The monastery itself, at one point or another, was on the mainland. This would be a bigger site than we thought. So Oliver, in his wisdom, said, come on, let's dig this. So we put a trench right across the um, part of the curved line. And this is what we found. Um, I have to say that we were there for two days. We had about 20 volunteers doing work here. And just as we were about to leave at 5 o'clock on a Sunday night, Oliver dug a little deeper, and sure enough, you can see the line of, the, of a man-made ditch. Now, for those of you that know probably a lot better than me, um, this, these kinds of monasteries during this time period, the early medieval period, were often surrounded by ditches called valons. And it, it was a symbolic boundary for the sacred space inside. So we thought, wow, this could be information here. So we, we um, dug deep down, and we didn't get finished until about 9 o'clock at night. But we did see, we, we went down a, a, about a little more than a meter. And you can see as you go down that it um, gets uh, more and more deep. And at the end, it extrapolated on the way up on the other side, it would have been about uh, four meters across, about a meter deep, which is consistent with Valens and other monasteries from that period. So, very exciting stuff. Two minutes. Thank you. Um, anyway, um, 
That's as far as we got. We did take samples from the bottom of the trench, and they're a way for analyzing. And we'll find out more when we when we find out. So here's our true happy dirty at the end, nine o'clock on Sunday night. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that um, you may know already that um, we were out on Saint Surf's Island in 2011 and 12. Oliver has written up his findings from that, those dates, and other field work that was done out there, and it's available today. I believe outside, if you want to get it, it will be available online. Um, we also conducted our own graveyard survey. Port Mark Moakes Church moved to its current site close to Scotland Whale in the 1660s. We conducted a survey of the churchyard using GPS software and we created a digital map of every headstone and monument in its grounds. Uh, we recorded over 180 individual locations. Uh, we will now intend to record the inscriptions in, on all of the monuments and we'll create a complete and interactive database of the churchyard which will then be made available online. Uh, we also, as mentioned, we did a lot of work with the school. We conducted our own muscle day. Um, with the school, the children had the opportunity to dig up their own playgrounds with no reprisals whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, few could resist, so we have a lot of children digging in their own playgrounds. We also um, dug in Michael Bruce Cottage Museum Garden. Given the locations of the sites and the age of the me medieval outfields of the village and close to the location of an old lime kiln, uh, we weren't surprised that we found lots of old industrial material in the form of clinker from the lime kilns and medieval pottery that would once have been scattered across the fields. There's just some of the, the children that enjoyed digging up the playground. Uh, we also ran a competition for two pupils to become an archaeologist for a day. Uh, the two winners uh, had an archaeologist come along to their own gardens and to the joy of their parents, they dug their own trench in their own <laughs> gardens. Um, so we had some great finds, we had a fantastic day and it was a, a great way to inspire the children and give voice to the people who once lived, worked and learned in their village. Uh, so last weekend we had our final public airport walk event. We had a day of celebration to share what we've uncovered together this year and we ended with a massive bonfire in Cayley. So we'll soon begin the process of reporting back to our funders and what we'll tell them, in essence, is that we've made lots of new and important discoveries. Uh, we saw so many happy faces taking part over the year, and the fantastic feedback that we've had has been testament to that. We feel that we've created a significant legacy. There's so many areas within Port Moak that we could go back to. Uh, I think there's an awful lot still to uncover, um, and we will hopefully build on that in the future. Um, so that, there you go, HLF, that's report done, I think. Um, thank you very much.